Welcome to the fourth quarter and full year 2019 Financial Results Conference Call and Webcast for Kindred Biosciences. At this time, all participants have been placed on a listen-only mode. At the end of prepared statements, participants will have the opportunity to ask questions. To ask a question during the session, you will need to press star 1 on your telephone. Please be advised that today's conference is being recorded, and if you require any further assistance, please press star 0. Please note that the remarks today will include forward-looking statements and that actual results could differ materially from those projected or implied in our forward-looking statements. For a description of important factors that could cause actual results to differ, we refer you to the forward-looking statements in today's press release and the note on forward-looking statements in the company's SEC filings. It is now my pleasure to turn the call over to Kindred Bio's CEO, Richard Chen. Dr. Chen, please proceed. Thank you, Operator. Good afternoon, and welcome to our year-end 2019 financial results call. Joining me today from the management team of Kindred Bio are Denise Beppers, our President and COO, Wendy Wee, our CFO, and Katya Buer, our VP of Corporate Development and Investor Relations. 2019 was an extremely successful year with two approvals, multiple positive pilot studies, the commencement of two pivotal studies, as well as the development of our half-life extension technology. We're very proud of the progress we made last year. Today, we're very pleased to announce the transformative transaction of Meritas. We have agreed to sell Meritas to DECRA in exchange for $43 million upfront payment and global royalties. We're excited about this partnership, which places Meritaz in the hands of a global leader in the veterinary industry. We anticipate that Meritaz growth will accelerate with this and that we will stand to reap financial rewards from this great medication in the years to come. There was intense interest in the rights to Meritaz from multiple parties. The size of this transaction validates the value we're creating, given that it costs us approximately $5 million to develop Meritas, this will be an excellent return for us. Concurrent with this transaction, we will be reducing our commercial footprint. It has become clear that even with an excellent commercial organization with top people from industry, we just didn't have the scale necessary to maximize the potential for Meritas. When we decided to launch Meritas, we did it based on data. We had extensive market research data that indicated self-commercialization was the right decision. And while Meritas has done extremely well, given the economics we're now able to get for it, we, it made commercial sense to find a partner. We believe part of good management is the ability and willingness to pivot when circumstances and data change, and we are doing that today. It's a gut-wrenching action but as a management team, we're taking that necessary step. We anticipate that we will look for larger commercial partners for our products going forward and hew more closely to the human biotech model where smaller companies partner with larger company, companies for the majority of drugs. It's a successful, validated model that we expect to replicate. By downsizing our commercial organization and partnering on products, we expect substantially diminished requirement for additional dilutive capital, and we believe we will maximize value creation for our shareholders. In parallel, we have been in extensive discussions with potential partners on our IL-31 antibody. We believe that we will have an attractive transaction on that molecule as well, given the high level of interest that other companies have shown on that asset. I should note, though, that IL-31 is at a much earlier stage than Meritaz, though we believe it has greater commercial potential. So the upfront payment is going to reflect that reality. The value of assets climbed exponentially after approval as compared to before approval. Now, turning to our pipeline, we have had seven positive pilot programs in a row from our biological pipeline. In addition, we are investing efforts to advance new antibodies, incorporating the exciting half-life technology that we recently announced. 
we can't advance all of our candidates and therefore have to prioritize the most promising candidates. So while our small molecule candidates are very attractive and while our equine candidates are tremendously exciting, we have decided to prioritize biologics programs for dogs and cats. We have great molecules and we have even greater molecules. So we're going to focus on the even greater molecules, molecules like IL-31, IL-4R or SYNC, EPOCAT, parvovirus, and so on the molecules that have the greatest blockbuster potential to maximize returns. I should note that these programs are progressing very well. We're on track for approval of parvovirus by end of this year or early next year, as we've stated before, and other programs continue to look very promising, as Denise will further discuss. For the equine molecules, we believe there's a potential equine-only business that can be very appealing. We are therefore studying ways that we could potentially fund those assets separately and or spin off the equine business. We plan to come to a decision on that in the near future. So we will be restructuring our workforce, which obviously we hate to do, but it's in the best interest of the business. This does not mean we will stop adding talent in the areas of focus. We are adjusting our workforce to align with the prioritization, and we will continue to invest, albeit carefully. Financially, we will be very prudent. Excluding our one-time restructuring charge, our OPEX for this year will decrease, and by next quarter, the run rate for our OPEX will drop significantly to approximately $54 million per year. We will achieve our goal of turning OPEX around this year. So to summarize, we have now validated the fact that we can monetize assets very profitably and that there is great demand for innovative products, especially after they have been be risked. We have multiple products that we expect could have an order of magnitude greater potential than Merit has, and we're within one to three years of approval on those products. We have stepped back from spending a substantial sum on commercialization efforts, and this will allow us to reduce dependence on diluted financing. We have more products in our pipeline than we can pursue, so we're prioritizing those that are the most promising. We have a proven team that can that has demonstrated that we can execute with two U.S. approvals and an EU approval. We're hitting on all cylinders, and we look forward to another successful year. With that, let me call, turn the call over to Denise. Thank you, Richard. When Richard and I first discussed starting a company developing innovative medicines for our pet family members, and a number of you on this call will re recall me count, recounting this story, we agreed that biologics would need to be central to our approach. Um, in fact, we were so convinced that biologics represented the future of veterinary medicine that we waited nearly a decade to start Kindred Bio until the cost of large molecules made sense for pet parents. With this clear vision that biologics would one day dominate pet therapeutics, we set about building the capabilities that would make us a leader in this technically rigorous field. We hired world-class protein engineers responsible for some of the most successful human drugs approved and built a state-of-the-art biologics manufacturing facility with virtually end-to-end -end capabilities, all the while securing two small molecule approvals to show the potential of our business model early on. And that is why I'm confident that prioritizing and accelerating our innovative biologics candidates while transitioning to a more capital-efficient model for commercialization will position us even more strongly for future success. Turning to Miritaz, as Richard said, we view today's announcement as further validation of the value we have created in this product and as a company. By commercializing this product, we have learned that a much larger infrastructure is needed to change practice patterns when a generic is on the market. That being said, our team has done an outstanding job given their resources. In the quarter, we recorded Miritaz revenues of 1.3 million with market penetration reaching 55% and the reorder rate among purchasing veterinary, veterinary clinics growing to 71%. Average order size continued to grow quarter over quarter. Looking ahead, we are confident that DECRA is the right strategic fit to deliver results for Miritaz globally. Not only does DECRA have a sizable commercial infrastructure, but what really makes them a great match for Miritaz is their focus on the sale of technical and value-added specialty pharmaceuticals. DECRA has successfully developed market-leading brands, particularly within the field of chronic disease management, and importantly, 
They have a complementary feline product portfolio targeting diseases linked to feline weight loss. Given the synergies between Miritaz and DECRA's existing product portfolio, Miritaz will represent an important cross-promotional product for DECRA worldwide. And being based in the UK, they are also well positioned to launch Miritaz in the EU. We are working with DECRA to complete the transaction expeditiously so they can bring the product to market as soon as possible. We're very pleased with the launch of Zymeta IV to date as well. As the only equine drug to gain approval last year and with a lot of anticipation in the market, the response at the American Association of Equine Practitioners Convention in December was extremely encouraging. The vast majority of people who stopped by our booth at this leading annual event placed an order. We've also found universities have been quick to implement Zymeta into hospitals and the largest compounders have voluntarily taken it off their shelves and at times even shared with us their customer list. This, as you can imagine, is quite unprecedented. The cost of Zymeta is $30.60 per vial to veterinarians. You may recall from the Miritaz launch that we're unable to recognize revenue unless a reorder is placed within the same quarter. Given we've received approval of Zymeta at the end of November, I'm pleased with the revenue we were able to record in the quarter of $127,000. Turning to our core biologics programs, as you saw in today's press release, all of our pipeline candidates are advancing as planned. Regarding our IL-31 program for canine atopic dermatitis, the scale-up process is proceeding and we expect to start the pivotal effectiveness study in the second half of this year. We remain in late-stage discussions with a number of parties regarding a commercial partnership. For our IL-4-13 sync program, the in-life portion of the pilot effectiveness study is complete, and we are completing development of the PK assays to read out the study, so you should expect a press release announcing the results in the coming weeks. As you know, back in December, we unveiled positive pilot results from a laboratory study of Kind 032 our IL-4R monoclonal antibody. While the study was a single-dose study designed primarily to assess safety and pharmacokinetics, we were very pleased to see evidence of positive efficacy and a dose response observed at week one. Both the IL-4 and IL-13 pathways are key drivers of inflammation that underlies atopic dermatitis. The zinc molecule binds to both IL-4 and IL-13 circulating in the blood, while kind 032 binds to the IL-4 receptor on the surface of immune cells. Once we have the SYNC study results, we will be able to determine if there is a difference in the clinical profile of both programs and whether to move forward with both or with one. As we've mentioned in the past, while we don't develop all of our, uh, while we won't develop all of our atopic dermatitis programs, we will likely bring several to market to take advantage of heterogeneity among patients, rotation between different drug classes, and the potential for combination therapy. Our EPOCAP pivotal study is ongoing and PARVO remains on track for approval by the end of this year or early 2021. In short, we are really pleased with the progress of our biologics programs. I am confident this industry-leading pipeline, which addresses significant market opportunity, provides greatest potential for value creation. With that, I'll hand the call over to Wendy for a discussion of our financial results. Thanks, Denise. The transition to a biologics-only company that leverages the commercial capabilities of multinational partners to maximize product value will result in a more capital-efficient business model with less reliance upon dilutive sources. By focusing on our highest value biologics programs and realizing partnering capital, we expect to reduce operating expenditures and extend runway to the launch of key biologics candidates. Proceeds from the sale of Miritas to DECRA, along, together with the workforce and operational reduction announced today, are expected to prolong runway through 2022 while maintaining a focused research engine. As Richard mentioned, we will remain in late-stage discussions with a number of parties regarding the commercial partnership for our IL-31 antibody for atopic dermatitis. For 2020, we anticipate operating expenditures of 58 to 61 million, which includes a one-time restructuring charge of approximately 1.7 million and first quarter expenditures consistent with a full 
organizational structure. Excluding first quarter expenditures, the annualized run rate is expected to be between 54 and 56 million this year. It is important to note here that the success of our development model and lower than expected attrition rate, the continuation of small molecule candidates would have resulted in a much higher operating base. As part of this strategic realignment, we plan to eliminate approximately 53 positions, which primarily relate to the companion animal sales force and research and development for small molecule programs. The associated restructuring charge of approximately $1.7 million includes severance and the extended health care benefits in recognition of the current external environment. The reduction in workforce is expected to lower compensation and benefits costs by approximately $7.1 million annually. In the coming year, we intend to hire additional staff to enhance our biologics manufacturing capabilities, but still expect a net reduction in head count and lower year-over-year -year operating expense from 2021 onwards as we seek additional opportunities for savings. Under a partnership model, we expect a combination of upfront payments, milestones, and royalties. Turning to our, to our financial results, in the fourth quarter, we reported a net loss of $15.7 million, or $0.40 cents per share, compared to a net loss of $154 million, or $0.46 cents per share for the same period in 2018. For the full year, the net loss was $61.4 million, or $1.59 per share, as compared to a net loss of $49.7 million, or $1.60 per share in 2018. Net rev product revenues total $1.4 million in the final quarter of the year versus $1.3 million in the year-ago period. 2019 net product revenues were $4.3 million compared with $2 million for the prior year. Keep in mind, Miratest became commercially available in July 2018, while Zymeta became commercially available in December 2019. Future global sales by of Miratas by DECRA will be recorded by Kindra Bio as royalty revenue. Cost of product sales totaled $0.2 million for the fourth quarter, resulting in a gross margin of 87%, and $0.6 million for the year, leading to a gross margin of 86%. Research and development expenses were $7.1 million for the fourth quarter, compared to 70 compared to $7.8 million for the same period in 2018. For the full year 2019, research and development expenses were $28.3 million versus $26.4 million in 2018. Stock-based compensation expense related to research and development was $1.8 million, compared with $1.7 million in 2018. The $1.9 million increase in full-year R&D expenses was primarily due to higher headcount and related expenses as we advance biologics programs, higher consulting expenses for the quality assurance programs, and increased capital equipment depreciation expense. Selling general and administrative expenses totaled $9.6 million for the quarter, compared with $9.2 million for the same period in 2018. For the full year 2019, SG&A expenses were $37.9 million versus $26.5 million for 2018. The $11.4 million increase in full year expenses is the result of being a commercial company, as well as increased expenses incurred by the Elwood Kansas plant in the lead up to its commissioning. In addition, higher corporate infrastructure costs and stock-based compensation expense also contributed to the increase in expenses. Stock-based compensation expense included in SGNA was $5.5 million in 2019 versus $4.5 million in 2018. Net cash used in operating activities in 2019 was approximately $56.3 million, 
We also invested approximately $8.4 million in capital expenditures for the build-out of our Elwood, Kansas manufacturing facility, including equipment purchases. As I mentioned earlier, we expect operating expenses to range between $58 million and $61 million this year. That is excluding the impact of stock-based compensation expense and the impact of acquisitions, if any. It is important to note here that excluding the one-time restructuring charge of $1.7 million and first quarter expenditures consistent with the full organizational structure, our annualized run rate would be between 54 and $56 million this year. Additionally, we plan to invest $46 million in capital expenditures on lab and manufacturing equipment for our biologics programs. As of December 31st, 2019, we had $73.5 million in cash, cash equivalents and investments, compared to $73.9 million at December 31st, 2018. Upon closure of the Meritas transaction, which is expected in the second quarter, we will receive a cash payment of $43 million, of which a customary 10% will be held in escrow and paid it paid out beginning in 12 months, assuming no escrow claims. In closing, I want to emphasize that we advance our R&D efforts with an incredibly talented team that is fully vested in this strategy and the future of the company. And we look forward to updating you on our progress next quarter. I will now turn the call back over to Richard. Thank you, Andy. Operator, we're ready for questions. Thank you. And as a reminder, to ask a question, you will need to press star 1 on your telephone. And to withdraw your question, please press the pound key. Please stand by while we compile the Q&A roster. And our first question comes from the line of Brandon Folks with Cancer Fitzgerald. Your line is now open. Hi. Thanks for my questions and congratulations on the announcement today. Um, could you just elaborate in terms of how are you thinking about taking these products that you have in the biologic pipeline through development, at what stage in development of these drugs will you seek partners versus develop them further? Just any color to help us think about that. Um, and then maybe if you could just update us on, I know we talked about the partnering with IL-31, but is this something that partners are looking to, to partner on IL-31 as well at SYNC? Um, any color, how to think about that would be great. Thank you. Sure, absolutely. So the partnering strategy will depend on the molecule. So it'll be molecule by molecule. There are some molecules, such as the atopic dermatitis molecules, where the market is fully validated and there is a lot of interest, even uh, at an earlier stage. And then there are molecules where we anticipate the uh, value maximization will be towards the later end of the development. So our preference would be to partner later rather than earlier because, number one, it doesn't cost us very much to develop these molecules, at least compared to the human industry. And number two, we've seen from Meritas that the value could go up 10x or more um, once we, it's been de-risked. So it'll be molecule by molecule. In terms of IL-31, there are certain partners who are interested primarily in IL-31, and then there are partners who are interested in a broader dermatitis franchise. So we are having discussions on uh, both types of partnerships. Okay, thanks very much. And maybe just one follow-up, if I may. Um, How should we think about the investment in the Kansas facility going forward with regards to the partnership model, um, would you be looking to manufacture products out of there? Um, should we think of a bit of a CDMO type business as well? Just any color there would be great. Thank you. Sure. So we expect to manufacture most or all of our products from Kansas because right now there is a shortage of manufacturing capacity. So most of the partners we're talking to do not have the capacity to manufacture. Uh, Even if they have a human parent that has manufacturing capabilities, those are usually completely booked. So uh, that's number one. And number two, we have been getting inbound inquiries about contract manufacturing, 
in this Kansas, the Kansas plant. We don't have plans to expand capacity solely for contract manufacturing, but in areas where we have excess capacity, um, and that's in the filling line in Kansas and uh, some capacity in Mitten Road, we're certainly having discussions with those potential partners. Great. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Sure. Thank you. And our next question comes from the line of John Block with Stiefel. Your line is now open. Thanks, guys. Good afternoon. Um, this first question may build on, on, the, on the prior questions, but I think you, you talked about starting the pivotal for IL-31 in the back half of 2020. I think you said 2H20. So, Richard, you know, now with the cash runway extended with the sale of Miritaz, and you talked about the more f favorable terms the further out you go, are you guys giving any thought on sort of waiting longer to secure a partnership until you have the IL-31 results, the pivotal results in hand, in order to call it, you know, sort of maximize those terms? Just would love your thoughts there. You know, John, that's an excellent question. Uh, we were, at one point, we were thinking maybe the terms on the veterinary side were not as favorable as on the human side, but it just turns out that you just have to wait a little bit longer before you can get those kinds of terms. So that is certainly something we're looking at. You know, with the new model, it changes our burn rate, and um, uh, we would not rule that possibility out. Okay. Um, and then maybe just to pivot on Miritaz, I, I think you mentioned, maybe I'll try to dig in a little bit into the agreement with DECRA. So I, I think you mentioned a royalty amount. Is that royal, Does that royalty amount differ, you know, here in the U.S. versus Europe since it's a little bit more established? here in the U.S., and then the follow-on to that would just be, is it royalty and milestone or strictly royalty? Thanks for your time, guys. Yeah, so it's it's uh, strictly royalty, and the royalty does not differ. It's a uh, global right. Are you willing to ballpark for us uh, what that rate may be? I think we can say it's uh, low double digits. Low double digits. Okay, perfect. Thank you, guys. Sure. Thank you. And our next question comes from the line of Balaji Prasad with Barclays. Your line is now open. Thank you. Hi. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. And uh, firstly, uh, glad to see this uh, focus evolving or narrow focus on biologics now, both this divestments um, and your uh, pure play positioning. So uh, that said, you just spoke about the royalty and metas. <clears throat> also wanted to understand your timelines around the equine subsidiary and what your thoughts are behind it. Thanks. Sure. So we're exploring that. I mean, we we find the um, equine space very interesting. You know, it's it's almost a specialty area, if you will. So we have a very talented small team, and we have an exciting pipeline, as you know. So we will be um, sequestering all of that into the equine franchise, and at the same time looking at whether to spin that out. Uh, to stand on its own or to divest of those assets, and we'll you know, work closely with our equine team to make that determination. Got it, Dennis. I have a second question, basically tying up your cash flows and your, uh, and your pipeline thoughts over 2020 and 2021. Uh, the way I see it right now, after the details you've provided, looks like you have an OPEX plus CAPEX of around $67 million. And current cash is 74 million. You get 43 million more and 7 million of workforce reduction. So if I back out all of this, I'm left with approximately 60 million of cash at the end of 2020. How would that be sufficient for 2021 and 2022? Uh, is there something that I'm missing here? Well, I'll let Wendy um, take you through that calculation. Well, we have um, 70. Yes, we have 73 million at the end of the year. Um, and on top of that, you add um, the 43 million. We we are, we are reducing our operating expenditures and to to a run rate of roughly 53 to uh, 54 to 56 million. Uh, mm -hmm. Included in there are depreciation expense. So if you back out, you know, depreciation expense. Uh, okay. You, you find that we should, our cash would last us until the end of 2022. 
Got it. Can you also kind of uh, extrapolate this to what it would mean for your pipeline developments now? What is going to be priority in 2020 and in 2022? Yes. So we will be advancing our topic dermatitis candidates as well as parvovirus yeah. people. And then the repositioning allows us to start moving ahead with some of the biologics that we had not been able to. And we will focus on validated commercial markets over uh, less validated markets. So there are a handful of markets like um, pain, dry eye, and a few others where the potential for um, the commercial potential has been proven. And since we are queuing more closely to the human model, we think that will uh, attract more partners. Mm -hmm. Uh, so that's a decision that we'll be making over the coming couple of months. All right, Richard. Thank you. Good luck. Sure. Thank you. And our next question comes from the line of David Westenberg with Guggenheim Securities. Your line is now open. Hi. Uh, thank you for taking the question. So I, I think Parvo now, yeah, I think you, you have the timelines of the uh, end of 2021. Is that the next uh, major approval you expect, and, and why did Parvo come so much faster than maybe some of the other compounds? Sure. So we expect the um, approval the end of this year or early 2021, um, and the reason is we have a very um, streamlined development program because, as you can imagine, Parvo is highly contagious. Um, so the agency has agreed to uh, laboratory studies. And so it's very confined, very controlled. We have control over the timeline. And so we believe, given how collaboratively we've been working with uh, USDA, that we should see an approval by the end of this year or early next year, assuming that the studies are positive. Got it. Okay, thank you. And then um, can you talk about your decision about when to partner? I think you just mentioned that um, you, you found in animal health it's, it's maybe you want to partner a little bit later. Um, so, yeah, just any kind of color in terms of it, when we're looking at your, your on-the-market, I mean, your in-development compounds because, you know, right now uh, with the new business model, I mean, all these are, will likely be partnered. So, I mean, are we going to be seeing the vast majority of your partnerships now um, after approval? Thank you. Um, it's going to depend on the molecule, on our capital requirements, and the uh, amount that partners are willing to pay at different stages. For certain indications like atopic dermatitis or, let's say, pain, we think that the amount that partners are willing to pay earlier in the development program could um, be quite attractive. For certain other Molecule, we may wait until later on. Um, so, as I said, our preference would be delay if we can, but having said that, uh, part of our business model is to rely on upfront payments more going forward than uh, additional financing where possible. So, it'll be a balance. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. And our next question comes from the line of RK with HC Wainwright. Your line is now open. Thank you. Um, congratulations, Richard and Dennis um, and uh, Wendy. Thank you for uh, giving me this time. Um, most of my questions have been asked, but uh, a couple of them. Uh, number one, you know, as you think through the um, uh, equine business, um, you know, either as, as a separate entity or, or a diverse teacher, or have, are you going to start accounting for that business as a separate? business um, in, in, in your financials, um, and would that happen from either from the first quarter or second quarter of this year? Um, I'll answer, and then I can, when you can add to it, we eventually will. Um, I, we haven't decided exactly when to fully segregate it. Right, so right now our financials. Uh, right now our financials do include um, uh, equine activity in it. But right now, there's, we haven't moved assets into it. Yeah, that's right. That's correct. Mm -hmm. yeah. okay. Thank you. And Richard, and then um, you and I talked uh, a little bit about your half-life extension technology um, um, when, you, when you initially announced about this. Um, 
uh, certainly, you know, it's an exciting piece of technology that, um, you know, you, you and your team have developed. How do you plan to take that forward? And also, uh, I would think the folks on the other side of the aisle in the human health business would be interested in this sort of technology. Do you see any interest there? Um, and, you know, do you want to make any commentary at all um, uh, about this? Sure. So we plan to incorporate this into much of our portfolio going forward because almost every molecule we have can benefit from longer half-life or lower cost of goods. Both of those things give us a competitive advantage. So for the molecules we have in the pipeline already, we'll continue developing them, for, but for many of them we'll have a follow-on molecule. And then for new molecules, we will likely incorporate this technology. In addition, uh, other companies seem very, very interested in this, and we think that there's licensing opportunity for the technology. Now, turning to the human side, it's a very interesting question you ask, because on the human side, there are technologies that extend half-life, and entire companies have been built solely on half-life extension. We have developed our own technology because the human technology does not work very well for other species. And that's why uh, we've developed our own. So um, what I can say is it's a very valuable technology on the human side. It doesn't quite uh, cross over across species. Thank you. Thanks for taking my questions. Sure. Thank you. And our next question comes from the line of Ben Hayner with Alliance Global. Your line is now. Good afternoon, guys. Can you hear me? We yeah. can. Excellent. So just first for me, was part of the reason to do the, the Miritaz deal uh, to kind of set a marker saying, you know, hey, look, we've got $43 million up front plus worldwide royalties for it, and, you know, the atopic dermatitis market is at least, as you said, an order of magnitude larger you know, hey, how about a little something for the effort? Give us an order of magnitude higher economics on some of these other programs that we're working on. Uh, I, I don't think our thinking was uh, directly that, but um, if you'd like to draw those conclusions, <laughs> yeah, that's uh, uh, fine. But really, you know, it's a, a business decision, a, dif a difficult one, but clearly the... Um, a scale of commercial effort needed to maximize uh, the potential for Meritaz um, was larger than what we could provide. So rather than um, spending more cash on pursuing that, we recognized that we needed to make a pivot. Now, having said that, once we started discussing terms, we realized what we said, which is that for a, uh, a an asset that's approved, uh, where there's market demand, companies are willing to pay. Okay, that, that makes sense. And, uh, you know, with the questions that I've already asked, maybe I did overthink that a little bit, uh, and, <laughs> and and perhaps this next question too. But uh, it, it, with a statement you just made, in, in that uh, you're seeing companies that are willing to pay, but in getting rid of the commercial organization and switching to the the new model, do you worry that you have less leverage with would-be partners, and you won't be able to say, you know, go pound, pound sand, we'll go commercialize it ourselves? You know, um, that is a possibility, but given how much interest there was, we had enough competitive tension among the bidders, um, so I don't think that's what's going to happen. Uh, if we only had one or two bidders, then we might run into that situation, but when you have multiple, multiple bidders, um, they're really bidding against each other uh, less than they are bidding against uh, self-commercialization. Okay, that's fair enough. And then lastly, for the overthinking questions, you know, what proportion of the economics do you think was attributable to the uh, package inserts accolades that you've gotten with Miritaz? Was it half, two-thirds? What do you think there? Oh, I love this question. Um, for those of you on the phone who have no idea what this is about, um, at our last conference, um, there was a regulatory discussion at Western Veterinary Conference, and 
Miritaz was used as an example of an excellent uh, package insert. And I think, you know, right there, I mean, that's just a testament to our team. And I, you know, we, we have had, we have an outstanding team. They made a, an incredible footprint for Miritaz. And uh, as Richard said, I mean, this was a gut-wrenching decision because uh, we've hired the best talent and, and they were entrepreneurial folks. And uh, unfortunately, we just couldn't quite sustain it um, at this point, but um, yeah, thank you for that question. Yeah, and you know, I wanna I wanna echo that the the uh, package insert, promotional material, our logistics, our um, our outside and inside sales reps, um, our uh, reps who handle the corporate accounts, executed perfectly. All executed perfectly. So. Um, it was it, it it was a fantastic team doing a fantastic job, which made this, this decision difficult. Uh, so it really comes down to scale and the amount of capital that is available to you know, uh, absorb the initial cost. Okay, great. Thanks. Uh, that's it for me, th- and I appreciate you taking the uh, trifecta of overwrought questions. <laughs> Thank you. And our next question comes from the line of Brooks O'Neill with Lake Street Capital. Your line is now open. Good afternoon. I was just curious. I have a sense that Denise's primary role has related to the commercial side of the business. Do you guys envision uh, her role evolving uh, under the new approach? I don't think so. I mean, I have, my role spans, you know, clinical development, regulatory commercial manufacturing, you know, all of the operations. So, um, yeah, there's plenty. We, you know, we have an outstanding team that supports me. I've, I've hired exceptional leaders, uh, which is why I think the scope of my responsibility has been able to be so great. Um, but we will be focusing now certainly on, you know, the biologics, the uh, equine subsidiary of which, you know, there is still a commercial team certainly. Um, as well as you know business development, so there's there's quite a bit to do. Should go from wearing four, four hats to three. Four, <laughs> four. <laughs> eight hats. Uh, <laughs> as you um, think about the discontinued efforts with the small molecules, do you see any opportunity to harvest any value there, or are you just going to shut everything down? Oh no, we'll uh, we will um, look into out licensing those molecules. Many of those are uh, very promising, and if we didn't have the top priority uh, molecules that we're focusing on, those would be those would be excellent candidates. Great, thank you very much. Thanks, Brett. Sure. Thank you. And our next question comes from the line of Nathan Weinstein with Aegis Capital. Your line is now open. Hey guys, congrats on the news and thanks for taking my question. Um, just firstly, a uh, broad-based macro question on current events uh, with COVID. Any anecdotal comments on what you're seeing from the uh, VET channel in terms of traffic? Um, and then if you could secondly give us an update um, on or remind us what the most recent update was on EpoCat. And then finally, on uh, with Decker, do you have a system in place just to make sure that there's no supply interruptions on Meritaz in the channel? Sure. So I'll take all of those, Nathan. So for COVID, um, we haven't seen any um, disruption just yet. However, uh, we are preparing that it may impact some of our clinical trial enrollment, you know, and certainly potential, potentially uh, some temporary sales with uh, owners, you know, sequestering and not going to the vet as often. So we, we hope that's short-lived, but we are preparing for that, certainly. Um, on EPOCAT, um, I think your question was around timeline. We are uh, enrolling in the pivotal study. Uh, as we said, we expect that to take about 18 months. So, you know, we'll, we'll continue to give any updates um, if there are any. And then as far as channel disruption, um, I could tell you that DECRA has been exceptional. Um, our teams have been working together. Um, we are way ahead of the curve, so we really don't anticipate any uh, issues, not to mention the, um, our, our CMO has been terrific uh, in working with both companies to make sure that's the case. Thanks so much. Appreciate it. You bet. Sure. Thank you. And there are no further questions at this time. I would now like to turn the call back to Dr. Richard Chen, CEO, for any further remarks. Thank you, Operator. I'd like to thank our listeners for your support as we continue to advance the promising pipeline and execute 
on the strategy we laid out today. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, this concludes today's conference call. Thank you for participating. You may now disconnect.